Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. A lot going on as usual today. In my newsletter, I, despite all the horrific things that are going on in the world, I thought I would focus on, on at least some extraordinarily positive things, or at least temporarily positive things. The fact that the Ukrainians were able to seize and arrest uh, this fugitive Ukrainian oligarch who is very, very close to Vladimir Putin. Putin is the godfather to his youngest daughter and uh, posted pictures of him. It's one of those indications that the Ukrainian special forces are doing things that are pretty impressive. Meanwhile, President Biden is using his words. Unlike other Western leaders and members of the administration, he is willing to accuse Vladimir Putin of committing genocide in Ukraine. It is interesting watching some of these folks tie themselves around their own axles. You know, should we call it this? Should we call it that? No, nope. I mean, you know, to his credit, Joe Biden said, look, it's genocide because he is trying to destroy the Ukrainian people. And, you know, the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, had very strong words in response. He called uh, Biden's remark uh, the true words of a true leader. What's interesting, of course, is the top U.S. officials have resisted using that term up until now, you know, even though we've had all this evidence of the brutal torture and the killings and the accusations that Russia has committed war crimes. Meanwhile, we're also getting the story the Pentagon is looking to vastly expand weapons for Ukraine. But as usual, there's lots of confusion about what that means. Does it mean armor? Does it mean helicopters? Yesterday, it meant helicopters and armor. Today, it meant it means apparently armor, but not necessarily helicopters. We will wait around to find out. But as uh, Elliot Cohen writes in The Atlantic, this is the war's decisive moment. This is the moment that will determine uh, really what the world is going to look like for the next generation. So we're going to take a deep dive into the background of a lot of things that are going on. We are very, very fortunate to have as our guest today, Ruth ben Giat, who's a professor of history and Italian studies at NYU, also an MSNBC opinion columnist. Her latest book is Strong Men, From Mussolini to the Present. She also writes a newsletter called Lucid about threats to democracy and abuses of power and how to counter them. So everything that you've been working on seems amazingly timely today. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. And and this uh, Putin's murderous war on Ukraine, all the conditions under which it's being waged and backfiring, um, it's like seeing what I wrote about in my final chapter, which is, you know, when they fear their power is waning, they do reckless things. There's even a term called gambling for resurrection. Mm -hmm. And I, it's like all of this is unfolding uh, just as uh, it's it's unfolded before, which is why it's in my book. It's extraordinary. Okay, that's a scary phrase. So what what is gambling for <laughs> resurrection? Because you have me nervous already. <laughs> so I, I truly think that Putin had intimations that his power was at its peak. And also, uh, it was no accident that, you know, this comes after this, uh, the summit in June 2021 with Biden, and Biden's clearly going to be very tough on him, uh, unlike Trump. And so he, he started, you know, thinking about his place in history and, and f getting more insecure. And just like Mussolini and Hitler and Gaddafi, when they get into the state where they fear um, that their power is waning or it could in the future and they don't, they're maybe not immortal and infallible, they do these reckless things. And so it's called gambling for resurrection when you have some grand gesture, uh, usually imperialist, or something that will secure your place in history. And it's, and it was interesting that. Putin is giving all these speeches in which he's talking about history, clearly wants some kind of, uh, they all want to be Napoleon, um, and then they forget how Napoleon ended up. So gambling for resurrection, and usually it fails, it's because they, they do these things out of hubris and arrogance, and they don't consult with experts, just like Putin didn't game out the war with his military experts, because they think they are the experts. So it's a very particular stage I call it late stage autocracy. They've been in power for too long. They've had too much power and they lose perspective. So what was Mussolini's uh, gambling for resurrection? There's actually so many parallels. I, I don't think it will end the same way, but- um, One can hope. Yeah, one can hope, exactly. 
So Mussolini, he invaded Ethiopia and he got away with it and he mm -hmm. was at his peak. But when he went into war on Hitler's side, it was too early and they had tried to stay neutral for a year. But he went into World War II against the advice of all of his generals. And, you know, they weren't ready. Autocrats, they kind of ravage their military out of corruption or overuse. And so when things got bad, he was removed in 1943 by his own mm -hmm. fascist grand council. And it's very dramatic. He was removed at night. And he came to work the next day because he, he literally couldn't conceive that they would do this to him. And, and so I've been watching very carefully uh, what elites are doing. Um, and there are these isolated cases of people who have been with Putin from the very start, like Anatoly uh, Chubais, who was most recently his climate envoy, who resigned and left Russia. So you have, right now it's just dribbles, but you can have this phenomenon that happened to Gaddafi at the end where elites who've been with you for years, they start to separate their destiny from the autocrat because they think he's going down. So let's take a couple of steps back away from these events and, and what Vladimir Putin is doing right now in, in Ukraine, uh, because you've been writing about strong men. You have been writing about the threats to democracy. We throw around the word fascism a lot. Can you define for me what fascism is? Like, the reason I'm asking this is I'm not sure that people fully understand what fascism is and, and why it's a mistake to just assume that fascism and Nazism are the same thing. I mean, there, there are certain there are certain traits to fascism that I want to I want to explore as we we go ahead. So and, and again, maybe you think this is an unfair question because I've read analysts who said that you really can't define fascism very well because it's not a coherent set of beliefs. So what is fascism? Mm -hmm. is, is fascism an ideology or is it a posture and an attitude? Well, how do you, how do you describe it? It is an ideology. It's a political system. It's a phase of authoritarianism. That's how I have it in my book. It's the first phase along with early communism. It's also a way of life. It what for fascists, it's a way of life, a way of thinking. So there's a reason that <laughs> there isn't one definition of it, and, and that uh, goes back to the origins where Mussolini didn't really want there to be one definition. He actually wouldn't allow there to be an official definition for like over 10 years. And this is because fascism brings together these very disparate things. And the shock of fascism originally was that it put things together that weren't supposed to go together, such as revolution. So mm -hmm. Mussolini had been a socialist, and even in Nazism, it was originally the National Socialist Workers' Party. But it's imperialist, and the first and most durable enemies of fascism are always the left. So mm -hmm. people who today, like Dinesh D'Souza, who say, oh, fascism's left wing, this is just BS. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's hyper-nationalist, it's imperialist, so they, uh, most of them end up expanding, you know, imperialist wars. But, so it's very forward-looking in that way, and they, they claim to be modernizers, like Hitler with the Autobahn, and Mussolini supposedly made the trains run on time, you know, which wasn't true. But very important to fascism is victimhood complex, that the nation is victimized, that and, and so fascism plays on these um, negative emotions of humiliation. And you see how that goes up to today um, with, you know, people like Orban and Trump. And so that's how you get people. So you have an inclusion and exclusion. You, you, you know, exclude some and you include others. And so you make this new national community. And the last thing I'll say is that fascism was an attempt to have a model of mass society that protected traditional hierarchies. So mm -hmm. that's something that stayed on today. It's against emancipation of women, of people of color, of workers' rights. All of that was supposed to be shut down in the name of this different model of mass society. So all these things are brought together and some of them contradict each other, but that's how fascism rolls. It also was a cult of action, a cult of manliness, a cult of uh, sort of shamelessness, isn't it? I mean, this 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 cult of action for action's sake. Uh, you know, you mentioned the cult yes. of tradition. 
But, you know, I guess one of the, the, the questions that I have is when you look at something in, in modern culture and you is is it a little bit like, you know, the definition of pornography that 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 you recognize it when you see it, that when you look at it and you go, that sounds fascist because we have nothing in this country that's actually really fascist, but it's fascist light or something. So what is it? Is it the fear of the other? Is it the emphasis on hypernationalism, uh, social identity, the cult of masculinity, action for action's sake? What are the kinds of, you know, tells that you look for? It's all of those things. In fact, there's, there's a kind of, um, in, in Strongman, the, the, the point of writing Strongman in part was to identify this kind of playbook that started with fascism and then continues in different forms. So you have propaganda, you have to, you know, debase the truth. You have to create an alternate reality. Corruption is very important. And so a lot of these people, are, they, they claim they're going to drain the swamp, which was actually Mussolini's slogan up to today where they're supposed to be against globalists, right, who are mm-hmm. corrupt. So you have that. You have violence and the whole gamut of violence from threat and intimidation all the way to, to genocide. And Mussolini, too, committed genocide in the colonies in Libya. And, and then you have uh, Strongman is actually the first book that, that puts virility and, and machismo up there as a tool of rule. And so it's really easy for us to, to laugh at Putin stripping his shirt off, and Mussolini did that too. But it's deadly serious because the leader cult is absolutely key to fascism and and its expressions today. The the leader who is infallible, who has this very direct bond with the people and and every fascist and their imitators today use mass communication. So Mussolini had newsreels and Trump used Twitter. But the key is that you have this very strong bond with the people and you become their reference point and your reality becomes their reality. So that's also very key. And the the leader is the man, he's the everyday man, like the man of the people, but he's also a superman. Yeah, the superman. And, and, right. and that hasn't changed for a hundred years. It's very interesting. The everyman and the superman thing, and you have to have both for it to really work to, to get into people's emotions. Um, and once it bonds, it's very difficult for those bonds to break. And look what we've got. People were like, saying to me when Trump, you know, was voted out and his little, you know, coup didn't work. Oh, well, his, he's going to be gone. And I was like, no, he's not. He's not going to be gone (laughs) because, you know, he's been out of office for a long time, but he still has these millions of faithful followers. And that's quite typical. You know, there's also that, that cult of machismo. When, when I first started seeing it on, you know, right-wing social media, it almost seems absurd, this sort of emphasis on masculinity, you know, being the manliest man. But that really is central to this whole aesthetic, the aesthetic of fascism as opposed to the ideology of, of fascism, that you have to have the man on the white horse, the strong man, who can never admit weakness or failure, Correct. That's correct. And it's like the glue of all of these tools I mentioned, because the leader is also the man who gets away with everything, who gets away with things that others cannot. And so lawlessness, obviously, is very important to fascism. And also think about under Trump and Putin, who has a kleptocracy, and only he is untouchable. He gets away with everything. And then he spawns all these imitators. So so that's key. And the other way that the leader and his body and the aesthetics of it are key is that um, we've seen that the fascism and, and these strongmen appeal at times when a society has gone through rapid change yeah. or perceived mm-hmm. rapid change. So we were very, in 2016, we were very ripe for this. And Trump's no fool. He read, you know, he'd been a Democrat, but he scanned the marketplace and he realized there was a place for somebody who would who, for people who didn't like the fact that there was eight years of Obama, there was same-sex marriage. And so the purpose is to just shut all of that down. But the leader's body becomes an anchor, like a kind of stability for followers who feel that everything is unstable and everything is changing in ways they don't like. And so that's why they anchor on to the leader. And the leader knows that's his role. And so Trump was extremely savvy in in doing that. And I don't know if you remember um, one of millions of episodes when he came out of the hospital 
uh, which really scared his followers, Mm -hmm. Walter Reed. And he did this very strange thing, but made sense if you know these people. He walked up the stairs, uh, he went back to the White House, and then he just stood there and he didn't say anything, which like, you know, that's very unlike Trump. He's always blathering about something. And I thought, oh, that's really smart because his, his followers were so worried about him. They needed to just see him, you know, big and massive back in, in, on the balcony of the White House and enjoy the sight of him returned. And so he is extremely savvy propagandist and he knows how important those moments are for his followers. No, I remember that moment, how he turns and he takes the mask off and just sort of stands there with his chin strutting out, which was a little bit evocative. The theater. Yeah, he's expert at political theater and strongman theater. He's really, really good at it. I I think you've already asked this this question, but I just wanted to just double back on it. So you've described... You know the the nature of the strong man and the various qualities that he gets away with everything. Who does this appeal to? I mean, what is the audience for this? Is it the person who feels displaced by change? Is it the person who feels threatened by demographic uh, developments? Who's the audience for fascism? Because we, I think, one of the surprising things is not simply what Donald Trump does, but that millions of people look at it and go, "Yeah, that's what I want." Yeah. What is that? What is that audience? And there's a dialogue because the smartest ones do what they know is needed. And the thing about the strongman is the reasons they're so dangerous and, and so psychologically manipulative is that they say exactly what they know people need to hear. Hmm. And they will be anything you need them to be at that point in time. So Trump was like, oh, you're either forgotten You've been forgotten by everyone. You've been abused and manipulated, and I will save you. And some version of that has been said by every strongman. Um, And it works like a charm every time, especially in these moments, as we said, where there's been a lot of change that leave people feeling full of hatred or just uncertain. And the other interesting thing about this is um, even though they are uh, sexist and they often take away women's rights, women are an important constituency for strong men. And, and sometimes it's because, for example, if you're if, you, if the ones who are kind of really into, you know, saving white uh, privilege, if you're a woman, if you were a woman in Nazi Germany and you're an Aryan, you had huge status over non-Aryan men. And you were made to feel very important. And so their genius is that they appeal not only as sex symbols or as like defenders, like, you know, Putin's always saying, I'm the defender of Russia, but also as people who elevate them. And so uh, you see that women loved Mussolini. There's a whole constituency of women who love Putin called his babushkas. (laughs) And it can seem very perverse, (laughs) But that's just part of it. And so I made, right. you know, I have, I talk about that in my book and I have a lot of female perpetrators like torturers and all kinds of you know, women who felt that they were elevated by this. This is all fascinating. It's okay, so Donald Trump is not a student of history. He is not a deep thinker. He's not an intellectual. <laughs> He's a narcissist who is prone to believe his own conspiracy theories. And yet, And I wanted to bounce this off you. He does seem to have this almost reptilian instinct about what plays in this universe. He instinctually is doing what you describe. So how do you look at Donald Trump? The fact is that he did see something that other politicians haven't. He is in tune with with his base in a way that other politicians are not. To what do you attribute that? Yeah, it's true. And there's There's a lot of discussion now about there is this need that people have. And right now, the way that Democratic politicians with a small d are not trying, because see, you see that the bond that people like Trump want to have with followers is not a bond where they really cherish them. They want to dominate them. Mm -hmm. Remember Trump said during the Black Lives Matter protests, if you don't dominate, you're wasting your time. That's his whole conception. So- so the, the, what I found really interesting and terrifying when, when I wrote the book is that Trump basically has the same character as most of these other guys. The outcome is different because we don't have one-party states. In fact, you can even do this without totally recon, 
democracy in some places, but they are amoral. So they don't, a lot of things that other people wouldn't do to get to power are not a problem for them. They're opportunists, they're creatures of reinvention, and that's what goes back to they will be whatever they hmm. need to be to get elected. And they're brutal. They will manipulate, they will blackmail. They Look what Trump managed to do to the Republican Party. He took it, and it wasn't even his own party. Like Mussolini and Berlusconi, they founded their parties. Trump came in from outside. It's extraordinary. And in four short years, this storied, august party became his personal tool. And that's, that's what they do. Well, and, but Trump does actually watch what other, um, what real, the people he really admires, like Putin and, and she, she in China, he watches what they do and he talks about it. And he and admires so he this. is learning. Yes, he's learning from them. And this, of course, obviously explains why he has this bond with people like Viktor Orban and with Vladimir Putin, the, the kind of bond that he does not have with, a, say, a, a Justin Trudeau or an Angela Merkel. I mean, what really is interesting is the contrast, his sort of contempt for the leaders of our allied nations and his, his undisguised admiration for the the international thugs that you're describing here. I mean, he uh, he obviously sees some sort of some sort of a bond between them. Uh, and you know, it's, th again, this is not a mystery. Okay, so I want to dive more deeply into what's happening right now with Vladimir Putin in, in Ukraine. Let's do that right after this. This episode is brought to you by The Jordan Harbinger Show, which features in-depth interviews with some of the world's most fascinating minds like Ray Dalio and Malcolm Gladwell. Every Friday, Jordan also releases a Feedback Friday episode to respond to listener questions covering everything from conventional problems like leaving a dream job to doozies like helping someone escape an abusive relationship. You could also hear the latest news about Russia featuring a heavy hitting interview with Gary Kasparov and his experience with authoritarian governments. And that's just the beginning. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. Okay, we're back with Ruth ben Giat, who is an expert in all of this, whose latest book is Strong Men, from Mussolini to the President, and also the author of the newsletter Lucid about threats to democracy and abuses of power, how to counter them. You had a piece recently, you uh, tweeted actually a few uh, days ago, you tweeted, I, I actually sort of blend together, you know, writings and <laughs> tweets, but you, you wrote, shut this fascist 2.0 enterprise down now by giving Ukraine what it needs to prevail learn from history. And you were in, you were responding to a Putin advisor who was uh, saying that escalation is becoming more likely and that targets in that targets in Europe could or will be hit. Uh, so again, this is kind of a, do you agree that this is a crucial moment right now in confronting Vladimir Putin to confronting this, what you describe as fascist 2.0 in Ukraine? It, it absolutely is. It's a, this is war. Of course, it's all dangerous, but Putin said that uh, the peace talks are dead. Big surprise yeah. because, you know, autocrats don't really negotiate. They just like delay. They, they manipulate. They're not, they're not interested in negotiation. And, you know, now he is kind of trying to save face by maybe delimiting the scope of the war. But make no mistake, he is going to continue this menu of terror tactics and war crimes. And I wouldn't at all be surprised, unfortunately, if we go to chemical weapons, because he's always done that. He's always had war crimes and he used, you know, chlorine and sarin gas in Syria. And the thing, if you, what I'm always trying to do is, it, it's very unpleasant, but to think like an autocrat. And it's why I've been able to predict, unfortunately, a lot of what's gone on from the very beginning of this war, because I know how these guys think. So we see atrocities uh, in what he does, but he sees success um, in the past because he's done this, you know, he's done things like this in 2008, and then he had, you know, annexed Crimea, and now, he, and then he went to Syria. And every time he not only didn't spark a, a huge international reaction like we're seeing now, he was able to consolidate more and more power at home and, and steal more from the Russian people as he has a true kleptocracy. And I believe that every time we mention Putin's name, we've got to mention that he has a kleptocracy 
because we're seeing the ravages on the Russian military from years of stealing and corruption. That's one reason that the, the equipment is outdated. There's just It's very interesting to see. So I think he's going to escalate because he can't afford to lose his his, I look at it with, in relation to what's going on at home for him, and he's getting into a more and more vulnerable situation. You can only imagine the disaffection of the military at being kind of humiliated on the international stage. We're also facing the possibility of a global food crisis beyond anything that we've seen mm -hmm. since World War II. Ukraine kind of is uh, the world's breadbasket. How does that play into the calculation? Does 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 Putin see that as a weapon as well? Uh, global starvation. Yes, he does, and and um, and he himself was very he was very scarred by. Uh, you know, this kind of deprivation in his early childhood because of war. And then also, of course, the, the implosion of the Soviet Union and all of the hardship and, and mass suicides and everything. But his goal is always to undo the democratic order and to cause chaos and to cause disruption and to cause as much hardship as possible so the system will implode. Both individual democracies, he wants them to implode from within. And that's why he sponsors all these secessionist movements and disinformation and far right. And he's done that very you know, successfully here. But on an international order level, a food crisis and supply chain crises, all these things that are systemic are, are perfect. And it's not why he waged the war. He waged the war to annihilate Ukraine on his border, but... Certainly anything he can do to cause systemic chaos is, is, is part of his brand. So what do you make of this debate over the use of the word genocide? Uh, you, you have you know, French President Macron, who is reluctant to say it. A lot of the other uh, smart people in the American foreign policy establishment have been reluctant to use it. Biden is now calling it genocide. What do you, what do you think? Is the word important? Is it important to say it? It's really important to say it because that's what it, that's what the intention is. Mm -hmm. And you don't even have to, you know, we've some, some uh, real hardliners have been, you know, releasing kind of their programs for, for annihilation. And it's absolutely clear that in the intentions of many of them, they want to, so it's not just a defeat on the battlefield. It is what they call de-Ukrainianization, meaning the eclipse of the whole people. Mm -hmm. And again, not just taking over their traditions or their information structure. It's decimating and annihilating the whole people as a people. And, and so this is also shared, this goal is shared by like the Putin puppet Lukashenko in Belarus. And he says, he said, you know, before the war started and I was like, uh oh, this isn't good. He said, it's time for Ukraine to, you know, come into the Slavic fold. And what that means is that you have to annihilate them as a liberal, democratic, westernized country. And kind of, this is, this is what totalitarians do. You annihilate and then you rebuild, but you rebuild after breaking them. And so, you know, it's very appropriate to use the word genocide, um, and and it it makes the stakes very clear. Like Macron doesn't, France doesn't want to use that. You know, he's in a very close election right now. He's being very like cautious and cagey, but I think it's the right thing to do. What is the downside of calling genocide genocide? I guess I'm I'm thinking this through because I was listening to American foreign policy officials before Biden's uh, comment, and they were all parsing the phrase as if. If we used it, it would create trouble. It would offend Putin. I mean, what is what is the what is the downside of describing this this mass slaughter as a mass slaughter and using the word genocide? Why the reluctance? Putin doesn't care if he's called yeah, a war he, criminal. He, exactly, because he has the thing with Putin is that and this is where again we got to get into their heads. As awful as that is, they have no moral code. They have no humanitarian instinct. Indeed, morality and humanitarianism are for the weak. Like think your bleakest Nietzschean Nazi thoughts, and that's yeah. where Putin is mentally. So he couldn't care less if he's accused of this. The, the issue for the United States to use it, it, it's important, but the United States won't join the International Criminal Court. And so I'm hoping that this experience will um, correct that um, 
uh, because that is that's a failing because they're they're making accusations that you make because they can lead to trials. They can it's a legal category and it can lead to uh, you know corrections of this and punishment for this, the accountability thing. But the United States isn't part of that and didn't want to be part of that. So that's a that's a that's a, like a structural problem. But I I don't see any downside as long as you you don't think that using that term is going to change Putin's behavior. If anything, it's just going to egg him on further. Okay, so let's take a deep breath here because I I, I want to transition from what we're talking the, the horrors that we're talking about in in Europe to our domestic politics, and that's always tricky because of course. It's not necessarily binary. You're not, you know, either a fascist uh, or not a fascist. There are there are gradations and there are shadows and there are echoes. And I want to talk about that because you've written about that. And we'll do that in a moment. Hey, gang, I just wanted to drop in to say thank you for joining me here each weekday. And also, I want to give a shout out to our Bulwark Plus members who helped to underwrite this show and keep everything we do at the Bulwark sustainable. You might think that a Bulwark Plus membership is all about our newsletters like my daily morning shots, but really, Bulwark Plus membership is about a lot more than that. We're building a community of independent-minded, concerned patriots who value democracy and the truth. We make most of what we do free and accessible by everybody because you can't help save democracy from behind a paywall, but... We do have some great member-only benefits that I'd like to share with you, because in addition to our newsletters, members have commenting privileges and also have access to ad-free versions of this show and all of the podcasts in the Bulwark Network, like Sarah Longwell's Focus Group podcast and Mona Charon's show, Beg to Differ. And there's the Thursday Night Bulwark, a live video broadcast that we host for members each week on Zoom. You can give Bulwark Plus membership a try for the next 30 days for free. Simply go to the bulwark.com slash Charlie to claim your free trial today. That's the bulwark.com slash Charlie. Thanks. Okay, we are back. Ruth, this is the real danger. I, I think that the people will roll their eyes if, you know, having had the discussion of actual real fascists who are engaging in genocide, we then shift to and then Republicans in the United States are doing X, Y, and Z because, of course, there's they're not the same thing. So let's describe this. Is is there a continuum of this? I mean, when when we describe when we throw around words like fascist or fascist adjacent or fascist curious or authoritarian, how do you go from Vladimir Putin to Viktor Orban to Ron DeSantis? How do we do that? So all of democracy and autocracy is a continuum. And the the issue with fascism, I'm one of the few people that didn't call Trump a fascist. And a lot mm -hmm. of people were angry at me because I wouldn't do that because he uses fascist things. There's absolutely no doubt. But the point of my book was to say that it's an evolution and that fascism was one stage of, of a whole mm -hmm. history of authoritarianism that works differently today. So even Putin was voted in and Orban, you know, he just won re-election. Mm -hmm. So today in the 21st century, you have few, you still have military coups, but there are fewer. And, and you have uh, something called electoral autocracy in many places, and especially in Hungary. And the Republicans are all obsessed with Viktor Orban because they are going toward this, where you use, you don't shut down elections anymore and you don't shut down the opposition party completely. You just, um, you use way, you find ways to game the electoral system through gerrymandering, through threat. That's what's going on in our country where massive threats to election officials. And this is part of Steve Bannon's kind of uh, domestic capture of the electoral system. And Orban's done this. He's gotten judges, you know, he's appointed all these judges so that if you want to challenge results that you think might be fraudulent, all the judges are yeah. in his pocket. So you, you don't shut down elections today. You just make it very hard for the opposition to prevail. So I, that's why I don't use the word fascism for that. Okay. Il maybe illiberalism as well. Yeah. Illiberalism, author it's a stage of authoritarianism. Well, this is what you've written. You, you've talked about Ron DeSantis as a particularly dangerous individual, uh, and you wrote, it's not hard to see what he is doing in Florida as a rehearsal for illiberalism on a national scale. 
He's following a playbook that prioritizes not public welfare, but rather the intimidation and polarization of citizens, the better to facilitate the accumulation of the leader's personal power. Now, there are going to be some people on the right who are going to think that that's a rather vast overstatement. <laughs> oh, yes. And they've gotten in touch with me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because my, uh, as I published this essay in my newsletter, and then it was uh, picked up by the Sun Sentinel mm -hmm. uh, and published all over Florida. And so uh, I, I've heard from those people. So what's notable about DeSantis, most recently in his declaration that he said that he, he's going to have a Cold War with Georgia if Stacey Abrams is elected. And a Cold War is something that a nation does. It's not usually yeah, a state's leader. Yeah. So he's interesting because he was a Reaganite. He was a different kind of conservative. And then he had this epiphany and became, you know, a Trump acolyte. And he's, he's somebody, he's an example of how when you have someone like Trump come to power, they, the legacies, even if they get voted out, they, they spawn imitators who learn from their way of being a leader, which is a bully, which is authoritarian. And, you know, there's like uh, Florida legislators that, that they speak anonymously. So he's like a mafia boss. If you cross him once, you're dead. Um, and this is not how Democrats with a small D behave. And he's done all these policy things from the don't say gay bill to his very scary election, you know, security office, which which has a tip line, so that you can denounce people who uh, of election fraud and election irregularities. And now he's made those felonies. So he's setting up at 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 the with state institutions uh, and and heeding the things that he he's kind of glommed on to, you know, election fraud because he saw saw how well it worked for for Trump to keep his power. So I'm really looking at him as a model of um, leadership that is not at all democratic. See, the thing that makes a lot of this plausible um, is, is, is the love affair between certain elements of the right and Viktor Orban in, in Hungary. And I think you mm -hmm. and I probably share the same view that a lot of people on the right here in, in the United States are, are laundering their admiration for Vladimir Putin through Orban, that it's it's maybe a bridge too far right now to say anything nice about uh, Vladimir Putin, but if they cozy up to uh, if they if they cozy up to uh, Putin's number one ally in Europe, Viktor Orban, apparently they they consider that to be uh, acceptable. There's also this whole question of targeting gays, you know, LGBTQ uh, populations, which appears to be one of the great attractions of both Putin and Orban for people on the right. In your lucid substack piece, you cited Rod Dreher's tweet, Victor Orban wins crushing re-election victory, groomer's hardest hit. Governor Ron DeSantis, you are onto something. And you wrote, sometimes a tweet perfectly illuminates a political moment. This one <laughs> brings together the Republican adulation of Orban as a model illiberal leader, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' seeming embrace of authoritarian policies, and the global rights strategy of labeling supporters of democracy as groomers or people associated with sex trafficking and pedophilia. You know, if, if it was not for this open admiration for uh, illiberal authoritarians like Viktor Orban, you know, you, you could make the case, well, this is just an exaggeration. But they're saying a lot of this out loud, aren't they? Yeah, it, it's really extraordinary that Tucker Carlson... Yeah. Um, broadcast for an entire week from Budapest and was very open and said, should we consider Hungary as a model? And th they're, they're, they're open about it. And I also found it really disturbing slash interesting that Mike Pence, who isn't the biggest global traveler, you know, trotted off uh, to Viktor Orban's demographic summit, yeah. which was all about how we wow. need more, you know, white Christian babies. And on that occasion, because he knew he was in friendly company, he hoped, he said that he hopes that abortion rights will be, you know, taken away soon in the U.S. So he said something you may not want to say as openly here. And they see Orban's electoral autocracy and his demographic and anti-gay policies as working. And it gives them hope and it gives them a strategy to um, accelerate their um, 
attempts here, and that's what's gone on at the state level. So why has the LGBTQ thing become so central? It, it, it feels like it's the bloody shirt of 2022. It, mm-hmm. it, it, it almost seems to have replaced playing the race card. Why is that so central to Putin's politics, to Orban's politics, and now to American right-wing politics? Why that? Yeah, one of the things that um, when you do a book that's global in scope and goes over a hundred years, you you get these these continuities stand out that maybe you yeah. didn't expect. And one of the ones I found is that the big continuity and constant is homophobia. Really? In fact, not only do fascists and people today who are into white racial, you know, hegemony, they are homophobic, but <laughs> The anti-colonial leaders I talk about, I have Mobutu in the Congo, who, you know, these people, they hated white people, they hated imperialists. Um, Idi Amin, Gaddafi, all of them were homophobic too and put gays in jail or worse. So this is the big continuity, even more than race. Um, And that I found, that I found very sad and very interesting. And it explains why if you're trying to have ticking your box of what it means to be a good far right politician today, you have to be anti LBGTQ. Yeah. And they're obviously tapping into something that has uh, been around for a very, very long time. Interesting. That was not a card that uh, Donald Trump himself played, but I don't know how you would be able to come back from it, given what you just described. Well, he had he put Mike Pence there. Yeah. Um, to be his his you know pro evangelical very very traditional and homophobic because like, Mike Pence his whole war against getting you know look what he did with uh, people who had AIDS and yep. he's his he was his whole career was marked by homophobia so you know he 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 had that utility for Trump. Ruth ben Giat, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. It has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Uh, Ruth is a professor of history and Italian studies at NYU. Her latest book is Strong Men from Mussolini to the Present. You should also check out her Substack newsletter, Lucid, about threats to democracy and abuses of power and how to counter them. Uh, Ruth, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast. And we'll be back tomorrow. Do this all over again. We're all juggling life, a career, and trying to build a little bit of wealth. The Brown Ambition Podcast with host Mandy and Tiffany the Budget Nista can help with special guest Chris Browning. You know, I'll give a shout out. I have two co-workers, Mandy, who love your podcast. They found out about me podcasting because of the last time I was on on your podcast, That's the Brown Ambition. <laughs> we outed you. We yeah, outed you did. So you. spread it out a little bit further. Chances are if you work in an office with black women, Brown Ambition <laughs> is somewhere. Brown Ambition. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.